Hello, my name is Ed Johnson III, and I am privileged to serve as the planting lead pastor of Harvest Fellowship Baptist Church in DeSoto, Texas. Here at Harvest Fellowship, we are in a series on the book of James. In his letter, James seeks, in essence, to show us the relationship between our saving faith in Jesus and our righteous works for Jesus. So we hope and pray that you will tune in for the entire series to see this series or to listen to this series. And for more information about our church or to connect with us on social media, please be sure to log on to our website at harvestfbc.org. Known for his catchphrase, champagne wishes, and caviar dreams, Robin Leach was, as one author wrote, a symbol of unapologetic opulence. Okay. For 11 years, he was the host of a popular television syndicated show that featured celebrities, business moguls, and other personalities who had amassed extreme amounts of wealth. These well-off individuals were celebrated for their extravagant lifestyles. Thus, the name of the show was The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. What lays before us here in the pages of Holy Scripture, brothers and sisters, is not a passage that applauds the rich and famous but rather one that denounces the rich and filthy. Wow. Come on, man. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James has some strong words for those who are rich and living morally dirty lives. Or you can say they are filthy rich. So that we are clear, the problem that James addresses here is not simply concerning those that are rich or simply having wealth. Abraham, Job, King Solomon, and Joseph of Arimathea. You know Joseph of Arimathea, the one whose tomb was borrowed by Jesus for three days as he laid there in death until his resurrection yes, would occur on Sunday. All of them were people who had material possessions, who were materially wealthy, who were materially rich. God doesn't necessarily have an issue with us having wealth. It is when wealth has us yes, sir. Yes, right. is when things get morally out of whack. Come on, Doc. Come on, man. Paul said it best. This way in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, yeah. a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Yes, sir. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Let me pause here and say this parenthetically because I think it's necessary and it's needed in our day and time. And I think it may be needed for somebody that's in this room and even for me that's standing up here. And that is this. Don't become addicted to money. Come on, Doc. Come on. Come on. Or making money. Yes, sir. Yes. You see, if you keep chasing after that bag... That bag will eventually turn into your body bag. Wow. That's good. That's good, man. Sometimes literally and all the times figuratively. What I mean is that if you continue to chase money, it can result in the death of your faithful devotion to God and his church. Yes, sir. How many of us know people who are busy chasing money to where they don't have time for God or for his church or for his kingdom purposes? On, yep. Their devotion to God has virtually died because they are busy wanting to get more money. Or it could result in the death, hear this, of your relational intimacy 
in your marriage for some of you. Because you are so busy chasing money, you don't spend time with your spouse. It could, for, for others of us, result in the death of our financial stability. You used to be financially wise and frugal, but because you are so enamored with making more money, you start making unwise financial decisions and wreck your financial stability. It could result in the death of your emotional health. You used to have peace until you got so consumed with chasing money. That's all you think about. You sleep and you eat the Benjamins. You wake up thinking about dead presidents and you all you think about is money. It can result in the death of your spiritual maturity. It can result in the death of your relationships and friendships. The love of money, brothers and sisters, is not worth the cost you will end up paying. Come on, Doc. Come on, brother. Come on. So that's parenthetical. That's, that's just thrown in. Yeah, I know. But I felt something, I felt something right there. Look with me in James chapter 5, verse 1. James continues, or James says, Come now, you rich people. Very um, animated statement here. He, he is calling attention to those who are rich. Now, based on the tone, content, and context of this passage, James seems to be addressing those who are the unjust, unbelieving, wicked wickedly filthy rich people of his day. But why directly address these non-Christians in a letter that is to the church? If this is who he's addressing, why directly address these non-Christian individuals in a letter to believers? On, well, James utilizes here a common rhetorical device or figure of speech that is called an apostrophe. An apostrophe is when a writer directly addresses people who are not present for the benefit of those who are. Mm, okay. Did you catch it? Yeah, yeah. James knows the context that the church is existing in, and he seeks to directly address people who are not present because he's really trying to benefit and encourage the believers who are present to hear this read. So as you'll see later on in this sermon, I believe this passage of scripture, though it's not directly addressed to you and I as believing Christians, it will still bring us much comfort, especially for those of us who are suffering at the hands of other people. Yes, James continues to say in verse one, track your eyes there, weep and wail, he says to them. James does not say weep and repent. Right, right. He does not say weep or confess. This passage, therefore, is not one of advisement, but rather one of denouncement. He says weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. You see it there? Verse 1, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. He is denouncing them. He is pronouncing something yes, to them. Yes, there are two overarching miseries that James speaks of concerning those who are, morally speaking, filthy rich. Here's the first misery. It is the decay of filthy rich people's wealth. The decay of filthy rich people's wealth. This is in verse two and three. Matthew Henry comments here, speaking of these wickedly filthy rich people, their misery shall arise from the very things in which they placed their happiness. I'll rewind it, because that was good. Their misery shall arise from the very things in which they placed their happiness. What then, James, is going to happen to their riches? It's right there in the text. The tense of the Greek verbs here speaks not so much of what is going to happen. It is not speaking of what is going to happen to their wealth, but rather what has already 
happen to it as it is viewed in present time. Follow me. Look at James verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2. Your wealth is ruined or your wealth has rotten or rotted. What he's saying is their whole financial portfolio is ruined. It has gone up in smoke, as it were. It is like that scene, you know, off of Waiting to Exhale, when, when Bernadine yeah. takes John's clothes, yeah. the whole, his whole wardrobe, and puts it in his car, and drives his car out of the driveway, and lights up a cigarette, and throws the match, and, and put lighter fluid, and throws the match, and consumes all of his wealth. James is saying their wealth is going to be, it is like that. It is ruined. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's ruined. Clothing in that day, in biblical days, was a status of personal wealth. Yeah. The rich wore what James chapter 2, verse 2 calls fine clothing. In our day, it will be something like the rich wearing high-end fashion outfits and accessories from Oscar de la Renta or Gucci or Prada or Versace. So not only has their wealth rotted, James says their expensive clothes, listen, look at the verse, have become moth-eaten, larva also known as moth babies, get their nutrients from carotene, which is found in the organic animal fibers that clothes are made from. These moth babies have an eclectic appetite. Come on, Doc. They will eat wool, cashmere, silk, cotton, linen, fur, feather, feathers, etc., etc. James says that the larvae have eaten holes in their alpaca sweaters and Ralph Lauren Gregory Lennon silk cream colored trousers. The decay also extends to their precious metals. I hope you still have your Bible open. Verse 3 says that their gold and silver yeah. have become corroded yeah. Yeah. or tarnished. James's aim here is not to get into the scientific properties of precious metals. What is more than likely in view here is not pure, but alloyed gold and silver that is oftentimes used to make the expensive jewelry, utensils, and household items for the rich. The reason why some of you, what you're wearing now on you, for some of you, that jewelry is alloy material or metal. It's not fully gold. It's not fully silver. There are portions of metals that are in that particular jewelry that helps it harden and shapen into whatever it is that you have on your body. So James is not, is not trying to get into a scientific um, explanation here. He's not trying to get into the chemical explanation of what's going on with these particular properties or these particular items of gold and silver. But let me say this here. Even if it is pure gold, watch this. What may be scientifically impossible is always possible for God. I mean, if God changed the chemical composition of water into wine, then causing pure gold to corrode wouldn't be an issue for him either. So just in case somebody wants to argue science and the Bible don't mix, God is not confined to science. He is not confined to our natural laws. He can... He can supersede natural laws. He actually, because he made them. He can, he made them. So, that's the first misery. James says these wickedly filthy rich people, their wealth has decayed and is decaying. 
Here's the second misery that James mentions in relationship to these filthy rich people. It is this. It is the indictment against filthy rich people's lives. It's an, it's an, an indictment against filthy rich people's lives. In a striking image of a courtroom, James in verse 3, the end of verse 3, personifies the corrosion of their gold and silver. You see it? Yes, sir. The corrosion becomes a witness. Becomes a witness. It takes the witness stand, Chris and Jackie, places its hand on a Bible, as it were, and swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Yes, corrosion takes his or her seat and proceeds to give a damning testimony against wickedly filthy rich people that devours their lives like a raging fire. It is like the rich person is the defendant sitting before the witness stand and corrosion opens his or her mouth and begins to testify and their life is going up in flames before their very eyes. Wow, my Lord. Everything that they are saying is damning them as filthy rich people. Instead of storing up treasures in heaven, as Jesus instructs in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, corrosion testifies to the fact, it's right there at the end of verse 3, that they have stored up treasure in the last days. George Guthrie writes here, ironically, the rich have hoarded wealth only to have that wealth turn on them in the last days, the time of God's judgment. Instead of storing up riches for earthly comfort and pleasure in their latter years, they have stored up the wrath of God's consuming fire. They're, they're, this corrosion has become a snitch, a rat to the rich, to the filthy rich, ratting them out in God's interrogation room and came clean and said, he did it, she did it. They was hoarding, Lord. They've been hoarding all their life. <laughs> like a prosecuting, prosecuting attorney, James lays out the main indictment against the filthy rich in that day and time. It's right there in verse 4. This is the main indictment in their context, in their social context. Look at what he says. He says, here it is. The main indictment of the filthy rich is that they have refused to pay the farm workers who harvested their land. Wow. It's right there. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers wow. who reaped your fields. Wow. The rich, the filthy rich were stealing from the working poor by not paying them for the work they had done in their fields. These farm workers were more than likely day laborers. They would be similar to those of us that we see in our city. You go to certain locations or in certain businesses and you will see our friends who are standing out front and they are called day laborers. They're trying to get a job for that particular day. They don't have a salary. They don't have pension. It is day by day that they get paid. These rich folk, these filthy rich people, we're depriving them. We're defrauding them. Day laborers, like in our context, who, who are hired for a day to do light construction and light manufacturing and landscaping and different types of those types of jobs. But not only was that the, the main indictment, he continues, because there's a couple of more indictments that he has. He says in verse 5 that they have lived luxuriously. Um, some translations you will have that they lived selfishly. That is self-indulgence. That is a life that is lived in dogged pursuit of pleasure. And not only have they lived selfishly, they have lived luxuriously. Get the picture. These filthy rich people are, are indulging themselves 
on the very food that has been harvested by the laborers that they refuse to pay. They are working hard in the field, busting their, set their tails to the bone while the rich refuse to pay them and they're eating on the very food that they harvested from their land. Bring me them apples. Bring, bring, bring me, you know, that crop. Bring that in and uh, I'm going to shut the door and go on your way while I go in and fix me some apple pie. Yeah. <laughs> These rich were living selfishly. They were living luxuriously. They were living off of the back of poor people. They were getting rich and they were staying rich off of their backs. Many of whom, watch this, the poor, many of whom of them were apparently believers. Christians. Not only that, James says about them, he says it in the end of verse 5, he says, y'all have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. This is an image from, um, from the, the butcher's yep. market. They, that they would feed sheep and they would fatten up lambs only to be taken to the butcher's house. And that is what James is saying to them. It's an it's a, it's a image of judgment. You are fattening your own selves up for the day of God's judgment against you. It doesn't end there. There's more indictments. James begins to put out. Verse 6 is the next one. He says, you have condemned. Read the rest of the context. Condemn the righteous or the Christian working poor person. You've condemned them. More than likely, this is a reference to the filthy rich taking the poor to court. And then bribing, bribing the judge to rule in their favor, wow. essentially condemning the poor, yes, sir. paying a judge to handle their case so that it comes out in their favor. Or in some cases, it may have been where the rich causes the judge to throw that person, that poor person out of their land and into jail. It, it's. It's the rich and powerful who are, who, who are, who put up kangaroo, you know, tra charges, trumped up charges, paying a judge to look at it and making sure that he or she rules in their favor. If they go away with their wealth intact, the poor go away with nothing condemned, pronouncing them guilty in this case, that your charge, your lawsuit that you're bringing against this particular person will not stand in my court. So not only, to put it in an island, was not, not only did they have to spend, you know, fees, you know, to pay their lawyer, the poor person, they have to pay court fees, and then they go away having spent more money or borrowed money that they didn't have in the first place to try to get justice from a wicked judge who has been bribed by a filthy rich person. Believers. And this is not far-fetched because you remember this. In James chapter 2, verse 6, listen to what James, remember this? He asked the question. He says, are not the rich the ones exploiting you, and they are dragging you into court? See, this is why I say that this is, this, is, this is James condemning the filthy rich because they are doing things against Christian poor people. Amen. But it gets worse. I'm glad you still have your Bible there. Verse 6 says you murdered. You have murdered a righteous Christian working poor person. Follow Murdered? Mm -hmm. Murdered in, in, in what sense? M murdered, not only, not only in the sense of destitution, right? But murdered in the sense of death. Yes, sir. Yes. On June 14th, 2012, Robert Allen Stanford the former chairman of Stanford International Bank, 
was sentenced to 110 years in prison for orchestrating a 20-year investment fraud scheme in which he misappropriated $7 billion from his international bank to finance his personal business and lifestyle. Stanford was convicted on March 6, 2012, following a six-week trial and approximately three days of deliberation on 13 of 14 counts in the indictment. Stanford was convicted of one count of conspiracy to commit wire and mail fraud, four counts of wire fraud, five counts of mail fraud, one count of conspiracy to obstruct a U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission investigation, one count of obstruction of an SEC investigation, and one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. Part of the evidence that was used to indict, convict, and sentence him was 350 victim impact letters. One of those victims was a woman by the name of Cassie Wilkinson. Here is a statement she made. The sentencing for crimes like this has become so big and so long that they are comparing it to economic homicide. Wow. Wow. And really, that's what it is, she said. Someone murdered the life that I knew, that I worked hard for. We were not born with money. We earned every single penny economic homicide. But, but it, it, death here, murder here, can not only mean economic homicide, it could literally mean physical homicide. That, that, how so? Well, if you are a day laborer, Come on, Come on. you live day to day, your very life hinges on whether somebody pays you or not. Your very basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter, is based on whether somebody pays you or not. And if you have a filthy, rich, wicked person who doesn't pay you in a real sense, they can murder you because they are, they are defrauding you of being able to take care of yourself and be able to live. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is what was going on. Economic homicide and, and physical homicide was going on. Well, that's all good. I hear you. The reason why I believe that this message is applicable is because, hear this, some of us sitting here have been or will be defrauded by rich and or powerful people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Some of you know what it is to be defrauded of wages. You earned it. Right, right. Somebody defrauded you, swindled you somehow or another out of paying you. Others of you, believers, have been defrauded from raises. Come on, Doc. Come on. You may not have known the backdoor discussions that have happened about you, the evaluations that were given unjustly in relationship to you, and you miss out on a raise because somebody had it out for you. Somebody uh, was selfish. Somebody did not take their job seriously with integrity. Yeah. Yeah. Others of you have been defrauded out of promotions, job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And for some of you, you were not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. All you know is there was a position that came available. You knew you were qualified. You knew you were one who were vest was vested in the company. You had given time. You had proven yourself. And here comes this young whippersnapper who ain't got experience or a degree in what you do, and they get that position instead of you. Wow. And they knew, the boss knew, the supervisor knew, the board knew that you deserved that. You earned that position, but it was a good old boy system. It was, it was about who you knew, and there was a friend of theirs who they wanted to bring in, on, in hot on the hog so they can be a part of this empire that they were trying to build, and they defrauded you of a well-earned, deserved promotion or a job opportunity. Others of you, that was the reason why you experienced an unjust termination or you were forced to resign. Not because you did anything wrong. It was because some filthy rich people yeah. 
that were behind the scenes, powerful people that were behind the scenes that was pulling strings and forcing you out of that job. Mm -hmm. It's it's cases of gentrification in certain communities where people come in and, you know, they will say it's due to eminent domain, but they will tell you, you know, you can either, you know, we can either just basically put you out or you can take this meager payoff that we want to give to you and we'll move you down the street in some ghettoized community down here because we want to raise the, the, the value of this particular community. Yes, sir. And they find loopholes and ways to do it yeah. where, in, in essence, you are defrauded of your long-term home, the home that you built memories in, all because somebody wants to build up a community. Even on an individual level, some of y'all that I'm sitting here in this room, I know some of your stories. Mm-hmm. Persons in your life, family members that owe you money. <laughs> I mean, it's not $5. It ain't $10. It, it, it ain't $20. You, you, you put a significant inve- investment up. You said, I'll take care of this. Just pay me back when you can. And that was 20 years ago. That was five years ago. They still ain't done right by you. Others of you sitting here and that dude ran off, caused you all kind of misery. <laughs> caused all kind of financial strain in your life because he or she wanted to run off and be with another person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He left you high and dry. Right, right. But here's the hope. Come on, Doc. <laughs> Go back with me in verse 4. Go back, listen to what James says. He's talking to the rich, but remember, it's to Christians. He's trying to benefit them. Listen to what he says. Look, the pay that you were held from the workers who reap your field cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Mm. The ears of the Lord of hosts. Here's the hope, y'all. The Lord of hosts, the all Mighty God, our almighty God, hears your cry. He knows about the injustice. He knows about the mistreatment. He knows about the defrauding that took place. He knows about the swindling that took place. He knows about it. He saw it. He heard your cry. And injustice will not go unpunished. God... God will take care of his people. God will do what is right. He will do what is just. Sometimes that may be in time. Other times God may wait until the end of time when Jesus comes back. But one way or another, let me tell you, people may think they're getting away with something, but they ain't getting away with nothing. God hears it all. He sees it all, especially people who have mistreated his own people. And I want to tell somebody, be not dismayed. Whatever be tired, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. The hymn continues, through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. That's the hope. That is the main crux of this message for the church. If you are being defrauded, if you have been defrauded, if you one day will be defrauded, that God hears your cry. Even if the judge doesn't. Even if the lawyer doesn't. Right? And watch what he says. Watch what he says. He says at the end, I missed this one, at the end of verse 6, he says the righteous man doesn't resist you. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't resist the filthy rich person because he doesn't have the means to. She doesn't have the means to. But but listen, though though we may not be able to resist on, you, God. On, God. God's going to resist you. He, he will be against you. And listen, I want to encourage a believer today. Don't you take vengeance out, God. Leave that for God. God has ways. He has ways of taking vengeance out on people who are unrepentant, who are unbelievers, who do not turn from their sin. 
And that's not that for us to have that heart where we want to see people hurt by God, but we just leave it up to God. Do whatever you will. God, I'm leaving it in your hands. I'm trusting in your sovereignty and in your power for God. God is all powerful. I know they may be powerful, but they ain't powerful than your God. I Come know on, they may be more powerful than you, but they ain't powerful than your God. They're not more powerful than him. So trust your case to God. Take your case to the judge of, of heaven and earth. To our eternal judge and, and entrust your case to him. He hears you. Yes, he does. He sees it. He saw it. He has taken notice of it. And he will do something about it. Last point. It's possible that those James writes to there may have been a believer, I don't, I don't know, who was in a state of carnality and doing certain things of that nature. I think the word for that particular person, even if you're a believer or unbeliever, whoever the audience was, here's the point. If you are a perpetrator of injustice, mm. Come on, man. where for you today is turn from your sin. Yeah, yeah, yes. Trust in Jesus. God, hear this, when you trust in Jesus, Come on, Doc. when you trust in the perfect life of Jesus, when you trust in his substitutionary death on the cross for your sinful crimes against God, when you trust in the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, watch this. God says that he will overturn every conviction and sentencing that he had in store for you. He will overturn his eternal sentencing. He will overturn his eternal conviction over your life, and you can have eternal life and be forgiven of your sinful crimes against God and against the humans that you have perpetrated them against. Brother or sister, if that's you in the house, if you've done that, if you've been a perpetrator, stop it. Confess it. Be like, be like Zacchaeus when Jesus saved him. Lord, if I, if I have defrauded anybody, I'm going to do restitution. I'm going to make things right. And from here on out, because you saved me, I'm going to live right in relationship to other people. Right. And I'm not going to defraud them. I'm not going to do them wrong. I'm not going to mistreat them. Amen. <laughs>